trust that you will take your Bibles with me as we study together God's Word concerning a subject that we need to visit from time to time, and that is the idea of the money that the church collects. How are we supposed to spend that money? And when we think about the church and money, you say, well, why would those things go together? Because we realize that what happens is that there's money out there in the real world, but somehow it is collected by the church. Is that something that you equate with the church? It's interesting to me to see this last few days where Conway West met with the evangelist that we know in Houston, Joel Osteen. And it seemed like it was a rock concert. It was a lot of things going on, but the Fox uh, reporter says, no, it's church because they still pass the plate. That's church to you? That's church. If you pass the plate, that's church. Not a, give an expository lesson of, of the scriptures, they may have done that, I don't know. I know they gave testimony. But to look down and see what God would have us to do to appeal to the sinners from the word of God of salvation. I don't know if they did that or not, but they passed the plate at Joel Osteen's church. And I ask you the question, who gave us the right to do that? We're a church that belongs to Christ. Where do we get the idea that that's something that we need to do? that we're supposed to be collecting money, we pass the basket. Is that something that is authorized? Well, we go to God's Word and how we get close to God's Word and understanding the authority for what we do, for all that we do and word or deed, do all in the name or the authority of the Lord, Paul writes to the Colossians. But how do we take that Word that was written centuries ago written to a people that lived then and dead now, how do we take that and apply it in our modern society? We look at the commandment. Did he command that a church living at each, any time before the Lord comes again? Was it to collect funds? Do we have an example of the church in the New Testament doing that? If that was an approved example that would probably be something we could do. We have the authority to do that because Christ was working through the apostles, infallible revelation that they were giving, guidance. And some things may be necessarily inferred. It's necessarily inferred. There's an inference there that we could gain some information about collecting money. And what we begin to see in the Word of God, indeed there is a commandment for a church to collect money. Paul says, as I gave order to the churches of Galatia concerning the collection, so also do ye. There was a collection of funds that the churches in Galatia were ordered to do. That's not an example, that's an order, that's a command. The collection for the saints, as I gave order to the churches of Galatia, so also do ye. If I had no other passage, I would realize that the church that belongs to Christ, it has the authority from heaven. And it's something that ought to be uniform among local churches, churches of Galatia. The church, the local church in Corinth. So it wasn't something just for y'all, not anybody else. That one passage establishes that indeed that is true. Well, when that's the case, what about what we do when we collect it? Should it be spent on that Lord's Day? Is there anything in the Bible about, well, you've got the money coming in, and, you know, expenses don't always equal out to what we bring in. We have something left over. What are we supposed to do with that? Oh, you're not supposed to have anything left over. You spend it all when you get it. You spend it, you spend it, you get it, you spend it. Is there anything in the Bible, that New Testament, that they had a treasury? I never read the word treasury. 
Does a church have a, a treasury that we're, we're talking about? Is that the case? Well, in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2, upon the first day of the week, Paul writes to the Corinthians, let each one of you lay by him in store as he may prosper. Why, Paul? That no collections be made when I come. He didn't want to have to go to different places in order to gather the money. On the first day of the week, the saints were to lay by themselves in store. Well, I lay by myself in my house. I lay by myself in my house. You lay in your house. Paul would have to go collect it, wouldn't he? By necessary inference, we know they had a treasury. They had it at a central place where and it was already collected. He wouldn't have to go get the collection. That's necessary inference. Church had a treasury. We'll see other passages that they accumulated their money in one place at the feet of the apostles. There again was combining those funds and it was to be collected and it had a, they had a treasury. They had something there to, to it was kind of collected when, and as in Sapphira, when they gave their money to the church, Peter reminded them when you sold it, it still belonged to you. The point is, is that now it belonged to the church. And the question then comes, well, what are we going to do with it? We need to spend it, don't we? Well, how are we going to spend that money? Well, we might have a lot of great ideas. We might ask for the little place next door to come in here and we'll have a place for them to sell their coffee. That'd be a good business idea. We may try to save their souls too. And everybody could get coffee and pound cake and pumpkin bread and everything else I smell going on over there all the time. And that might be a good arrangement. I think that'd be a good idea. But what does the Lord command? What is his work? How's that money going out? What is that authorized work that they're to be involved in doing? And you know what we see, Paul, in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 8, he makes a statement that we can understand we have some authority for. He says, I robbed other churches. Now, he didn't go in and rob them by gunpoint. It's in a context where he took money from other churches because Paul was dealing with a church. Well, you didn't, you didn't take money from us, therefore you're wrong. And so he robbed other churches so he could preach to them. So he uses that word robbery. But he robbed other churches, taking wages of them, that I might minister unto you. Now let's look what that passage teaches us. He didn't rob individuals. He didn't rob disciples, individual disciples. He robbed churches. The collectivity of saints, and there were a plurality of those churches. That's what I get from that passage, don't you? I didn't, he didn't go up to individuals, take money from them, and he gets money from individuals, and we have no authority for the, for the collect money and do the work. What was his work? Well, if he's a preacher, it must be benevolence. Poor old preachers. No, he didn't take money as benevolence. He took it as wages. That's what the Bible says. Apparently some man can be out here preaching the gospel and he can take money from, from churches. Churches will send him money so he can minister and preach in the gospel and receive wages. He's worthy of his hire. He's taking wages for preaching the gospel from other churches. Now, Paul wouldn't take it from Corinth. He had his reasons. But he did that from other churches so he could preach in Corinth. There's an example that's approved. Necessary inference, I find the church had a treasury. Command, I find you could collect money, that the church could collect money. It was a uniform practice among churches. So yes, it is part of church to pass the basket. 
and we realize that this is how the church was doing its collective work. There would be a common agreement. We have elders here and they make decisions how it's going to be used. And we work and be involved in accomplishing the preaching of the gospel through our treasury. All of it is within the bounds of God's authority. By example, we have a treasury. And the modern treasury probably differ from just putting at the feet of somebody or a central place of location. We have banks. We have places that we, so we, we, we don't send it by carrier. We send it a lot of times checks by mail or Western Union. There's modernity in those things, but the principle is what we look at. And we realize this is indeed commanded of God. Well, what is that work that we're to be involved in doing? Well, one area we've already looked at with Paul, it was the idea of preaching the gospel as evangelism. The, the word is being preached. Can an individual do that or is that the work of the church only? Is that something, the church is going to do that so I don't have to do anything about evangelism? No. Because I have an example. Well, there was one man by the name of Epaphras. Now, while the church in Colossae had not, did not know Paul, Epaphras had taught them the gospel. He had revealed unto them the grace of God through his efforts. An individual. Notice what Paul says about this man, Epaphras, in Colossians, the first chapter, 6 and 7. Which is come unto you even as it also the world bearing fruit. we will talk about this word. Increasing as it doth also is since you, the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. Even as you learned it. Not of me, Paul says. Not of some church, but Epaphras. You learned it of Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, singular, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. He communicated to him. He's a fellow worker in the kingdom. He was involved in preaching that gospel. Jesus, before he went into heaven, Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19, he's telling his apostle to go ye and Preach the gospel. Make disciples of all nations. Go. <laughs> Baptizing them. Teaching them. They were individual men. Were they a church? Was that the apostolic church? No, they were apostles. They're going to be working in churches. But we all, because we love Jesus... We all can go about our way, go about doing the work of God and thinking about saving souls, evangelism. That's something that an individual can do. If you don't think that I need to get rid of all of my sermons called personal work. What does that mean, personal work? It means you as a person, as an individual, can do this work. Individuals should be involved in evangelism. Yes, we'll overlap because here the church is involved in that. But how do we collectively do evangelism? It's through our treasury. And that indeed happens. Paul says in Philippians, the first chapter, verses, verse 5, he praises the church in Philippi for your fellowship in the furtherance of the gospel. It was not maintaining the gospel between four walls. It was the furtherance of the gospel from this first day until now. I'm thankful. I'm thankful to God for you, brethren, for doing that. We drop over to chapter 4 in verse 15. And ye yourselves also know ye Philippians that made up this church in Philippi, that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church. You wouldn't say now, no individual among y'all. No, no church. He's speaking to them as a church, a collective now, including all the people, united in something. No church had fellowship with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but ye only. Who gave? The Philippians gave. Who received? 
Paul received it. Who delivered it? Epaphroditus did. Verse 18, I have all things in a bound I'm filled, having received from Epaphroditus the things that came from you. It's an odor of a sweet smell and a sacrifice acceptable or pleasing to God. I thought it was cold, hard cash. No, it's a sacrifice. It smells good to God. It's added to your account. That's what I liked about it. Not that I received something from you. But you as a church you're involved in furthering that gospel. And no other church, Paul says, is doing it. But there's the authorization for the church to be busy in evangelism too. We've already seen Paul rob what? Other churches, 2 Corinthians 11, 8. So he could preach in Corinth. One church can do it. Priority of churches can be involved in doing that, singing, sending it to that one evangelist, Apostle Paul. That was happening in the church that belongs to Christ in the first century. Is that just a cultural thing? Is that something that, well, we just did then, we don't do it anymore now? We shouldn't be interested in it. Well, the church can do it now, but I don't have to do it. No, we realize, no, we all should be involved in that. It is indeed an authorized work of spreading the gospel. And as a church, we're able to do that over the internet these days. You can do that on your Facebook. Oh, you've got ways of touching the hearts of people that only you can touch. And trying to use what things we have. They didn't have it back then. But we have that ability. But the principle is still there. And it is a work that we all should be engaged in. It should be something on our mind. Are we praying when we say our prayers and we pray for ourselves and we pray for our family and we pray for our local church and we get on the back of the page and we pray for people that are going through difficult times. Do we pray, lead me to some soul today? Or we just sing that maybe once a month in singing practice? Is that something on our heart all the time? The end of time's quicker, coming quicker than it was yesterday. It's uh, closer, I mean. That should always be on our mind. Thinking about certain individuals. Maybe somebody I meet at Starbucks. Somebody I meet at Kroger. H-E-B. Somebody I see in my neighborhood. We're thinking about people need the gospel. And we're trying to, to reach them with that gospel. That's a work in individuals, but it's also the work of the church. We're speaking about the work of the church, but benevolence is that way too. Benevolence is meeting a certain need. It's not something that continues all the time. It, this idea, I, you need help at this moment. Individuals can be involved in that. Children and grandchildren, the first Timothy 5 and verse 4. You require your own parents. That's something that I have to do. I've got parents. Grandchildren are involved. You requite them. You pay them back for those things good that they did to you when you couldn't help yourself. You requite them. Verse 16, you're to do that so the church would not be burdened. Now, all of a sudden from Scripture, we begin to realize God makes a distinction between the responsibilities of the individual and the church. The church is a collective now. It has a work that it's doing. You can't sit and argue, well, whatever I can do, the church can do. This passage says no. I've got to have the authority what the church says to do. And I know individually I need to take care of my own. But in verse 16, that the church may help those see to the needs of widows indeed. In that chapter, widows indeed, they're desolate. They're also Christians. They've lived the life of a Christian. And they had to be a certain age. Couldn't be oh, sick. They had, to, they had to be at that age and all these qualifications to be enrolled, put into the number by which the, the church could be involved in helping them in regard to the, to the widows. 
But individuals have a responsibility of benevolence. I need to take care of my own. But the church has that responsibility as well. And when we go to the Word of God, we begin to see that the church was helping saints only. When I read back through discussions and knowing from experience, and Dad could verify this, when the discussions were how the work is going to be used in benevolence and orphans' homes came in and old folks' homes, you know, you know, old folks' homes, we, we call it that sometime, came in and how the church is going to be involved in those things. In those beginning of those discussions, the idea of saints only was not a concept that was well voiced. Some debates were not even debated. They, they came up not in debates. But as men began to look at the discussion, they began to see every time we see the church involved in benevolence, they were helping not the general world, public, but they're helping saints. I got authority for that. Do I have authority for helping those who are non saints? I've got some material that an older man here gave to me before he died. And it's in a plaque. It's in a frame, uh, rather, in a frame. This man was a man that was very popular out in California. In fact, this man that I'm talking about would drive him to all of his meetings. That's why they were close. And looking at that frame document he had about what this man taught, he said the church was responsible, responsible of helping the poor. Helping the poor. That's as far as he went. And that's the way a lot of people thought. That's what a lot of people said, well, that helped the poor. Fast forward a few years ago, I was in going on a Saturday morning to go see the downtown churches that have combined all of their work to do inner, inner, inner city work. And they were showing, they were advertising the authority of really the social gospel. I wanted to hear that. I wanted to be in those classes. And one class that I attended was in an auditorium, and they took the pulpit away and put a trash can out there in front. Now, you may think I'll preach a bunch of trash, but I didn't, I didn't think that was good. But it was a scene. They're going to do, they're going to do a sketch. You know, they had the drama club from one church. Who's, uh, they have a whole church that has drama. And they put on a skit of somebody digging stuff out of the trash. Are we going to help the poor? Going to help the poor? The authority that, in that lesson was for Corinth. That here benevolence was being done and helping the poor. And I'm saying, poor what? <laughs> what you finish it? In my mind, saints. Saints, and you're going to see that in a moment. Just help the poor. And Paul was collecting money to help the poor. He was delivering it to help the poor. So that's been an idea, but even among those who said, no, we're going to use the church's tre treasury according to what the Bible authorizes, that was not always saints only. And that may seem harsh to people, but let's look at it together. Because the church involved in benevolence is found a lot of places in the New Testament. In Acts 2, in verse 44 and 45, the church is been established and you know about 3,000 souls were involved in being saved on that first day and it says in verse 44 all that believed were together so you had all believers that was their saints they were all together had things in common they sold their possessions and good goods and parted them to all according as any man hath need I don't read about a treasury there it's not a necessary inference there were people that had need but I come to Acts the fourth chapter I realize they pooled their resources. Verse 34 and 35, Neither was any among them that lacked, among who? The disciples, the Christians. For as many as were possessors of lands or houses, sold them, bought the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet. Were the apostles the ones that needed help? No. What are they going to do with it? And distribution was made unto each according as any had need. Any who? Saints, believers. Now here was a collection of the funds. 
Corinth had a collection of the funds. And over a period of time, they'd have those collection of funds. There's your treasury. But what we see here is uh, saints. We come to 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter. We've already seen concerning the collection for whom? The saints in Judea. 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter. And we see the same thing, the same collection. It's about more, more of a brethren, we make it known to you the grace of God, which has been given in the churches of Macedonia. Verse 4, beseeching us with much entreaty regarding this grace and the fellowship and the ministering to whom? The saints. All the individuals gave themselves to the Lord. They, the church in Macedonia, they gave themselves to this work. And they gave liberally out of their poverty. But it's for ministering, not to the poor, but to the poor saints. Speak where the Bible speaks. Say the rest of the sentence so we can have the truth. 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, and verse 1, for us touching the ministering to the saints. I know you've been ready a long time and just make sure things get ready. And we see that that's, that's true in verse 2, for I know your readiness of which I glory on your behalf to them of Macedonia and Achaia. He's using Macedonia and Achaia to get the Corinthians to finish their work. And he's using Corinth to encourage them back and forth. Your zeal has stirred up very many of them, he says. Verse 12, for the ministration of this service not only filleth up the measure of the wants of the saints, but aboundeth also through many thanksgivings unto God. Who's being ministered? Every time we see it's the saints. Verse 13, seeing that through the proven of you by this ministration, they glorify God, God for the obedience of your confession of the gospel of Christ and the liberality of your contribution to them and unto all. We must pause there. See? Unto them, saints. Unto all, all men. Is that what this contribution was going to be for? All sometimes can mean that. But sometimes all is limited to a context. Could it be we're going to be sending and you're getting thanksgiving whenever you do that unto these particular brethren in Judea who are saints, but in principle unto all saints. All could be including not only them in that locality, but anytime we do benevolence, it's unto them and unto all, and we get thanksgiving. They thank God for our work. Unto them but and all saints. Who did Paul deliver it to? Because he did. I know one thing in chapter 8, in verses 19 through 21, he wanted to make sure he did the bidding of the church in all things. He was very important that he, do, that he does that. Verse 19, not only so, but who also is, was appointed by the churches to travel with us in the matter of this grace which is ministered to us to the glory of the Lord and to show our readiness. Avoiding this, that any man should blame us in the matter of this bounty, which is being ministered by us. For we take thought for the things honorable, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. We know that the church was being charged being encouraged to take a collection for the saints. Is Paul going to take that collection that's for the saints? He's going to take it and deliver it to all the poor? Would Paul do that? I don't think so. When you look at 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter, you want to see Apostle Paul exalting the autonomy of the church. He's not pressuring them to even send him. In 1 Corinthians 16, verses 3 and 4, When I arrive, whomsoever ye shall approve, then will I send with letters. I'm not going to approve them. You do it. Local church autonomy. To carry your bounty unto Jerusalem. And if it be meet for me to go also, they shall go with me. He's got it collected now. When he writes in Romans, the 15th chapter, 
He's got it from Achaia. He's got it from Macedonia. He's got it from these churches. He's now writing. He's going to be bringing that to Jerusalem. But now I say in verse 25, I go into Jerusalem ministering to the saints and to all the poor. No. It's still what he told the churches. And he's still telling the churches the same line. It's for all the saints. Ministering to the saints in this particular locality. For it's been the good pleasure of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor. No. For the poor among the saints. Where are they? At Jerusalem. At Jerusalem. In verse 34, that I may be delivered from them, pray for them that are disobedient in Judea, and that my ministration which I have for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. Not everybody is poor. This contribution was not for the poor, but it was the idea that we would get, God would be praised, not only in this contribution unto them, but also every time we do it to all saints who are in need at a certain time. Otherwise, Paul pulled a fast one. He's an apostle. He can do what he wants. He said, hey, some of this stuff I'll deliberately, I'm an apostle. I'll take it to the people who are poor. No. He wanted to do things honorable to the sight of God and all men. He's not writing one thing to them and said, I'll just pull the apostle card and I'll do it the way I want to because I'm I over here. I, I left myself room. We'll do it unto them and unto all people. No. It's saints and saints only. The church helping its own. That concept is not well accepted and well known. Because we get people come by here all the time thinking the church ought to give them some money. And they're not members of the church. They never think they have to be. But see, there's the authority from God. I can help somebody individually. And I have to use good judgment. Helped one man, took an H-E-B, got a bunch of groceries. He said, can I have a little coffee too? I said, yeah, get a little coffee. He always comes during vacation Bible school. He came the next year too with the same story. I said, I talked to you last year. <laughs> I said, I'm not going to do it this year. Just bumming off churches. He said, I'm going to bring my kids. They're going to come to the vacation Bible school. We'll be there Sunday as I was going down with my cart through H-E-B. You want that? You want that? Now, was that good for me to do that for somebody that may have been hurting? Yes, it's good for me to do that. I've given money to people and I've watched them. I watched one man as I even gave him money. And I was there at the service station. This is how they do it. They just fake putting the money. He put the thing in the car and he acted like he's doing it. But he wasn't. I drove off. Parked in the back parking lot. I didn't know his apartment was right above me. But he went in, bought his beer, came back with his case of beer right by my car. He didn't know who it was. Now, helping people, helping the poor, I get kind of jaded. But I can't let that, I can't let that deter me from helping people who are truly in need. I've never had a person I've helped ever say thank you back. I don't ask to be paid back. I say, oh, I'll get there and I'll pay you back. I've never had that. Maybe you have. I've never had a thank you note. Does that mean I'm not going to help anybody? No, sir. And we have to realize there's people that have need. But there's a lot of people thinking that where we are as a church, they ought to help everybody, regardless of what their story is. The church, treasury, was to help saints only. And they were involved in benevolence. And edification is the third area. That's we build up. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, you got the miraculous gifts and the apostles and teachers, and they were there to 
build us up, build the church, the body of Christ up with its teaching. All of those, all of those, uh, we, we might call them offices sometimes in Ephesians, the fourth chapter. But it really was involved in teaching. Every one of them, every one of them had the idea of teaching, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. They're for the perfecting of the saints. And to the work of ministering and the building up of the body of Christ. We're to hear people that are being taken every which way by every wind of doctrine. Teaching will bring them back. We teach the truth in love. Love for their souls. Because they're going every which way. And love for God. Because we cared about their souls. We love them. Speaking truth in love, we may grow up in things unto him who is the head, even Christ. Verse 16, of whom all the body, fitly framed and knit together through that which every joint supplieth, according to the working in each do, do measure of each several part. We are each several part. We are the joints that hold this local congregation together. We're involved in building ourselves up. Edification in the things of, of God. Building up itself in love in verse 16. 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. There's list some passages here. When they came together, the way of love was edifying, teaching, so they could understand what the truth is. And that's why prophecy is better than speaking in tongues, because they're speaking in tongues that other people did not know. They didn't know that language. They're speaking that. It was a language of men, but they, the people there in that locality didn't know it. Well, that's not edifying. Because I don't understand what you're saying. And all through here, these verses, edification, edification, edification. Do things in order so edification can take place. Now, we have generic authority. But what about Bible class material? Where did Paul write a congregation and said, you know what, you need a curriculum. And you order from the office supply house in Jerusalem. And you get this four-year plan. I think y'all need to get that, and uh, you can take it out of your treasury. I don't need that. I mean, the New Testament wasn't even finished yet. That's something we do in our modern times. We have Bible classes where we divide our people according to their ability to grasp and some can take milk and some can take meat. We divide that. And we have Bible class material for that. Is that authorized? Well, how does a church operate if that is a, it is a work of the church, like evangelism, benevolence? How does a church do that through its treasury? Elders can decide, I think that would be a good thing to plan to do, this particular curriculum, written by men, but it's based upon the Bible and we have confidence in the authors. Elders make those decisions. Churches that don't have elders, they have to make that decision as a collective whole. Spend the money. It's authorized because that is a work that the church is authorized to do, to build us up in understanding the truth of God. What about the Lord's Supper? And the things that are connected with our worship together. Paul didn't, the apostle, they didn't specify a lot of this stuff. Does that mean they're not authorized? No. You know, in this area, individual responsibility might be very helpful sometimes. I've been told that some churches have a $6,000 communion table in their church building. Six thousand? I've got a two ninety five uh, TV tray. Two nine two dollars ninety five cents. Can we use that? Would that be put the elements on there? Would that work? I can go two ninety five. What about you? Oh, we have such a big. Well, I can get ten of them out here. You know, we could get ten. We could put a dolly on them. It could be done. There's anything wrong with the table we have? No. 
but a lot of things might be done more where that money could be used for the treasury. We could do a lot of things. We could buy some books. Places of worship, what do you find? They have a million and a half church buildings. Does that mean it's wrong to have a church building? No. But the New Testament times, they didn't. They met in houses. But you think when the gospel was first preached, they were meeting in a house? And after that, the church in Jerusalem had 3,000 people obey the gospel. They're going to take the Lord's Supper next Sunday. They'd be in places that would accommodate that. I couldn't get this much of people in my house. What about you? You have a house this big? I think it's conducive for worship. But you know, I remember back at the Parkview School where you started. I remember coming along and I remember those days where every service we had to pick up the chairs. We had to put them back in a certain place. I had to endure tooth decay week behind me all the time in preaching. Whatever the, that week, tooth decay, I had a lot of tooth teeth up there. And I had people looking at those things more than listening to me. It wasn't conducive for keeping people's concentration, but you know what? I got tired of taking chairs putting them up and putting them down. Is that why we have a building? Because we got tired of doing the chairs? I hope not. If that's what we have to do, we do it. But we have a place to worship. We have pews that are anchored. We don't have to pick them up and put them down. And we can buy the elements for the Lord's Supper. We can purchase psalm books. We can Put things on the screen with people's songs and whatever modern invention takes place. We can do all of that. We have the authority to do that as a place for worship. But we can do that through the, the treasury because we're here to worship and to edify one another. And God says, I want you to be doing that together. And when we get through, that's all I find as far as the work of the church is. In evangelism of preaching that gospel, and how do you do that? You preach the word. And you get in contact with the lost. And you preach the word. Helping needy saints at a time that they're needing that, what's help, and then uh, after that's over, it's over, and they can help us down the road too. It works back, back and forth. It wasn't something that was continually to do that, except in the area of those widows. Sometimes they're going to need that care from now on. But benevolence was there edification some of this can be done as individuals but it also is authorized by the church and I want us to realize that those are the areas in which God has directed us in his word that we know we have the authority to collect it we have the authority to distribute it into certain areas we know where those areas are evangelism benevolence and edification and that's all we have the authority for doing. And I hope we'll be satisfied with that. And young people, I hope that you can be grounded. One day you will be making decisions in a local church. They may not have elders. But you could be making decisions that we have authority for this. We don't have authority for that. And you'll be able to make wise decisions as you come of age in the Lord's church as well. This evening we lead a song. There for we call it invitation and talks about a new creature Paul says I have been crucified with Christ he had died when he had obeyed the gospel when he was baptized and had his sins removed he died to that old man all those sins he was raised to walk a newness of life and that's what we do with the gospel message we take it to heart and say Jesus you died for me I am a sinner I don't want to live with this guilt of sin. I want to serve the Lord. And I've died with Christ. No longer I that live, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, Paul says, I live it by faith. And him that loved me and gave himself up for me. Why don't you start living the life of faith as a new creature? Be baptized into Christ as we stand and as we sing.